Hey, man, well, it's been a, a phenomenal service already. I, I feel as though uh, if we were to go home right now, we'd probably leave very satisfied. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get into God's Word right here. Amen? And please be opening your Bibles to John chapter 10, verse 40. You know, uh, here in the congregation, we've been doing a study uh, on First and Second Corinthians. But I, I thought for this morning, it would be good for us to take a break from our study and to study out something that I think is a little bit more relevant to Easter morning. And so the title of my lesson this morning is The Resurrection and the Life. John chapter 10, verse 40. The Bible says right here, Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. You know, right here, we find uh, Jesus during a, a very difficult time in his ministry where John the Baptist had already passed away. He had been killed because of his preaching and his faith. And so Jesus, in mourning his friend John the Baptist, and also experiencing a lot of hardship and opposition from other people who are persecuting the way, he goes back to where John the Baptist had baptized in the early days and also where Jesus himself had baptized. You know, sometimes it's good just to go back to the beginning. But, you know, interestingly enough, back at this time, the Bible was put together. It wasn't meant to be broken up like this. The chapters were added later. And so understanding that's the setting that Jesus is in, and then we move on to chapter 11, verse 1, but that was never meant to be separated. And so chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You see right here, it's, it's as Jesus is reflecting, as he's considering all the things that have happened in the ministry of John the Baptist and also at the beginning of his ministry, while he's reminiscing of his own baptism, that this guy, Lazarus' sisters, report to him through a messenger that Lazarus is sick. Now, you know, who's, who's Lazarus? Well, Lazarus is a very special guy. One, he's brother to Mary and Martha. At this time, the Bible records several times where Jesus went to the home of Mary and Martha for dinner. And so Jesus didn't really have a lot of places like that. In fact, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 58, the Bible says, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And so the fact that he's spending time with these people, it must have been sort of a, a, a thing that doesn't happen very frequently. And so we can imagine that he got pretty close to Mary and her sister Martha and also to their brother, Lazarus. Also interesting right here is the messengers in communicating to Jesus say, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now Jesus loved everybody. And so distinguish one person above everybody else means that Jesus had a special relationship with Lazarus. Also very fascinating is Lazarus' name comes from the Old Testament word Eleazar. El meaning God and Azar meaning help. And so Lazarus' name means God help. And so here Jesus hears the news that Lazarus is sick and he decides to go and take care of his friend, the one whom he loved. Verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Now that's, that's reassuring. <laughs> No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. You know, right here, he hears the news that his friend Lazarus is sick. And he goes, guys, just, just don't worry about it. He's not going to die. Now, now, if you're reporting that somebody is sick, that's probably not very reassuring right there. But to make matters worse, Jesus just stays where he's at for two days. So again, Jesus, I, I thought you were going to go and help this guy. He goes, ah, we'll, we'll get to it, but he's not going to die. Don't worry about it. But also, the Bible records right here that Jesus saw Lazarus' hardship as an opportunity for God to be glorified in his life. I mean, how do you see your hardship in your life? Let's go on. Verse 7. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. 
But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, won't he get better? Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, no, guys, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas called Didymus, which means twin, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> wow. I mean, right here, Jesus gets his guys together. He goes, okay, guys, look, we've waited around for two days here. Now it's time to go and take care of Lazarus. And his disciples are, are, are thinking about the situation. Right here. Going, well, well, hold on, Jesus. Last time we went to Judea, it didn't look so good. In fact, I think that the people there in Judea tried to stone us last time. We, we should probably think about what we're going to do right here. And Jesus goes, look, guys, the day is short, night is coming. Now, this has a double meaning. One, what he's saying is literally the day is short, and it takes a while to get to Judea, and so we got to start on the journey now. But secondly, he's, it's kind of a, a double entendre right here, meaning that he's referring to life. Life is short. Light is short. Darkness or death is coming. And so while people are alive, we got to get to them and save them. You with me right here, guys? Let's read on. Of course, you got to love Thomas' response right here. Lazarus is dead. Well, let's go die too. Just, just chill, bro. We're just going to go help him out. <laughs> Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I and mean, what an amazing passage right here. And you do appreciate the faith of Martha, even in a time of tragedy. Here Jesus comes, and she goes, at first, you can kind of sense that she was feeling a little ticked off that Jesus hadn't come sooner. She goes, Jesus, if you were here earlier, my brother would have survived. But even now, I believe you can do whatever you want to do. You see, a lot of times it's easy to have faith whenever things are going well. And sometimes we even get fooled and tricked into thinking that we have great faith because things are going awesome and we're doing well. But it's really in the times of tragedy or hardship that your faith is truly tested. Yeah. You don't have faith unless you go through a hard time and you still have that faith. Amen. And so right here, she goes, I believe that you can do whatever you want to do. Amen. And Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Let's pick it up in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Does that sound familiar right there? Yeah. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been, born, been, been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone that Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. You know, this is an incredible miracle yet it's very interesting I, I, I got a little a couple of insights that I think will help us to appreciate what Jesus did here with the resurrection of Lazarus even more number one I found it fascinating that this account is recorded in the gospel of John 
but it's not recorded in the other three Gospels. Now you think, a miracle of this magnitude, I mean, all of the Gospel writers should record it. But it's very interesting. We know that the Gospel writers were eyewitnesses to the life and the teachings of Jesus. And so Matthew was literally one of Jesus' disciples. Mark was actually a disciple of Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus, and so Mark got his account from Peter. And then Luke was a doctor and a disciple of Paul. And most likely he had gone through like a doctor would and met with people and got with people and tried to get their perspectives as to what happened and pieced together the story of Jesus. And then, of course, John was one of Jesus' closest guys. But, you know, why would the other three gospel writers not record the resurrection of Lazarus right here? Well, I believe that Jesus did not include them in this miracle. They weren't there. This was such an intimate setting with his disciples. There was Thomas and there was John, but Matthew and Peter weren't there. So they didn't get to experience the resurrection of Lazarus. Thus, they didn't write about it. You with me right here, guys? The second thing I, I found fascinating right here is the Bible records that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now, this just slams anybody who claims that Jesus never raised from the dead or didn't raise anybody from the dead. They just were in comas. Because, you know, when you're dead four days and you start to smell, you're dead. You're with me right here, guys? You're not in a coma. But also fascinating was that there was a Jewish superstition that when someone died right here, their spirit would hover around their body for four days, seeking to go back into their body. After four days, their face decayed to a point of being unrecognizable, and so the spirit would then move on. That was their belief system. And so Jesus purposely waits two days so that he could call Lazarus from the dead after four days so that no one could say that he didn't have the power to raise people from the dead. Yeah. Lastly, we remember when Jesus resurrected, he showed himself to Thomas and said, Thomas, look at my scars. Look at my side where they spear. And he put Thomas's hand there and he felt the scars of Jesus. My point being right here is that when one is resurrected, they don't receive a new body. And so all of the damage that was done with the, while they were dead or in death is still there. And so you can just imagine Lazarus walking out of the tomb after being dead four days and his body starting to decay. What Lazarus would have looked like. And for every day of his life from this point on, everybody could look at him and go, wow, that's the guy who Jesus raised from the dead. And so what Jesus said was fulfilled. This was to happen for the glory of God. You know, there's four things that we need to have a conviction on this morning. Number one, Jesus can raise the dead. Number two, Jesus has raised the dead. Number three, Jesus himself was raised from the dead. And number four, Jesus will raise the dead again because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Amen. I've got three points. That was our introduction. Amen. Our first point is united with Jesus in his resurrection. Our second point is ignited by Jesus through our resurrection. And lastly, excited for Jesus and the final resurrection. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Paul right here and speaking to the Roman church. He says, or, or don't you know that all of us who are baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way... Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, right here, Paul gives us an understanding of what Christian baptism is really all about. It's a participation of what Jesus did on the cross in his crucifixion. You see, when we repent of our sins, we are literally crucifying our flesh with Jesus. Jesus was then buried in a tomb. We're buried in water. 
Jesus resurrected from the tomb, we're resurrected out of the water into a new life. And so if you've had a new life coming out of the water, what did you have when you went in the water? An old life. And so this is the literal point in time somebody goes from having an old life of sin to a new life with God. You with me right here, guys? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, several years back, my wife and I were, were hanging out in Texas. And uh, if you've ever been to Texas, there's not much to do in Texas. I apologize, Brandon. I know that I'm, I'm slamming your country right here. <laughs> and uh, we were just hanging out, and we were thinking, you know, it would be awesome to go and see, you know, some of the, the things that Texas has to offer. And so we're like, what is Texas known for? And so we went to the JFK Memorial, and, and that was a very sobering sight, to, to see the building where he was shot from. And uh, then we're like, well, what, is, what, is, what else is going on in Texas? And we're pleased to find that uh, Fort Worth is one of the two places in the United States where they print money. And we go, that would be pretty cool to find out where they print money and to kind of see it. And so we scheduled a tour with uh, the Mint there. And we went to there, and it was, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, you're walking around this warehouse, and there's literally pallets of $100 bills everywhere. Now, it's very heavily guarded, so don't get any ideas. <laughs> and so, so we're going around, and there, there's this one section that really stood out to me. And it was a section where they restore damaged money. And I, I didn't know this, but apparently a lot of people bury their money. They still do. And they bury their bills, which, when buried for a long period of time, turn into a lump of clay. And so this department would take these lumps of clay that people had buried, which originally were money, and they would figure out how much that lump of clay is worth, and then they would give them or sign a paper then give them the cash for what that money was worth. I go, that, that's amazing. That's exactly what God did with us. I mean, we all started out as being worth something. And then sin got in our lives and took us and reduced us down to a lump of clay worth nothing. I mean, you could take a lump of clay to a the store, they're not going to take it. But then God assessed our value. They're worth my son. And he took that clay and he turned it back into something that's worth something. Wow. And at that point, we went from an old life to a new life. Because we were united with Jesus in his resurrection. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians says it a little differently. In verse 9. <clears throat> it says, For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given the fullness in Christ, who is head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The Bible says right here that when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and then you were raised with Christ out of baptism by faith. So faith goes along with baptism. It's not just the act of being plunged into waters. That's why infant baptism doesn't work to say, because there's no faith along with it. And you can admit that most babies, when they're baptized, aren't even very fired up about it. <laughs> but the Bible says at this point, you, you were dead to your sins, and then God took you, and he made you alive in Christ. And he took our sins and the written code. And the Bible says he literally nailed them to the cross. I'm mean, just, just think about that for a second. Hey, you, who are you? I I'm Evan. Have you sinned? Well, yeah, I mean, haven't we all sinned? Come here. Do you know what the punishment for sin is? Well, uh, I guess it's death. Okay, put your hands up. I got a nail right here. I'm going to nail you to the cross. 
you know what? How about this? How about you hold the nail, you hold the hammer, and you go ahead and nail me instead? Wow. That's what Jesus did right here. He took our sins. He took the stuff that you and I have done our entire life, the things that we were in opposition to God for, and he put them up on the cross, and he nailed them there to his own body so that you could be dead to your sins but alive in Christ. You know, one of the most powerful examples I've heard is the story of a father and son. And uh, this father worked as a train operator. He would work on the tracks, and he would switch the tracks for the trains coming by. And uh, it was his son's birthday, and so he wanted to do something special for his son. He said, son, why don't you come along with me to work, and I'll let you hang out at the train station with me all day. My son's super fired up. He's like, awesome, I'm going to be with my dad all day. And so he goes with his dad, and, you know, they're playing together. The dad's showing them all the gears and how everything works and things like that. And as they're playing, you know, the dad kind of gets focused on his work, and the son's just off playing, off on his own. Well, sooner or later, he hears the train coming, and his job was to switch the tracks so that the train would go on the right track. Otherwise, it might end in a head-on collision later on down the road. And so here he is, he's, he's got his hand on the lever, and he's about to pull the lever to switch the tracks, and he looks over and he sees his little son playing in the gears on the tracks. And he's faced with a choice. I could pull this lever down, and it would pin my son to the tracks, and he would get hit by that train. Or I could not pull it down, the train would go by, my son would lift, but later on down the road, I won't even see it, but they're all going to die with a head-on collision crash. He thinks about it for a second. He didn't have much time, but tears coming down his cheek. He pulls the lever. His son gets stuck to the track. The train comes by and hits his son, and the people on that train went by not even knowing what had happened. See, I could ask you this morning, have you been united with Christ in his resurrection? Or have you been like the people on that train, just scooted on by? not even thinking about or worrying about or wondering about what Jesus did for your life. You see, Jesus canceled the written code when you're united with Jesus in his resurrection. But you know, when you understand that, when you allow that to hit your heart, then you can move on to point two, ignited by Jesus through our resurrection. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. Once again, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church. And at this time, the church in Corinth was probably around 10,000 people. So this is, this is not a small church right here. This is a mega church. And uh, he's preaching right here, and he starts off in verse 1. And Tyrone did a great job stealing my scripture earlier, so we'll just rehash what he said. It says, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and the, uh, the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. You know, right here he starts off and he goes, you know what, the gospel of God is really all about three things. That Jesus came down to earth, lived a sinless life, he died on the cross for our sins, and he was resurrected on the third day, all according to the scriptures. That's what the gospel is all about. The word gospel simply means good news. It's good news that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, because that means that you can be saved. And the Bible says this is what we preached. This is what we stood for. And then after Jesus resurrected from the dead, he appeared to Peter, to the 12, and then 500 other people, most of whom are still alive. You can just go ask them and they'll tell you. <laughs> See, it's impossible to deny when 500 people saw Jesus resurrected and they're still alive. And then the 12 that Jesus appeared to lived their lives out and eventually every single one of them was martyred for their faith. I mean, if the resurrection didn't occur, I'd say at least the one or two of them would go, you know what, forget this. It was all a lie. It was a fun joke while it lasted. But you know what? It was all a lie. I didn't really see Jesus resurrected in the day. Please don't chop my head off. Don't feed me to wild animals. Don't kill me. It was a joke. 
Uh-huh, we got a lot of contribution. But they all went to their deaths proclaiming that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Jesus did raise from the dead. You with me right here? But Paul goes on right here. And he goes, the last person Jesus appeared to was me. As the one I'm normally born. Remember, Jesus appeared to Paul on his way to go and kill and arrest Christians. And uh, it was so powerful that he ends up becoming a Christian. So you got to admit, that's a pretty radical change right there. You, you go from going to kill Christians to actually becoming a Christian. Anyone can change. But then in verse 9, he goes on, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now, it's very interesting right here. Paul is using a little bit of a play on words. Paul is his Greek name, which means small or the least. Saul, which is his name that he usually went by, means the great king of the Old Testament. And so he goes, no, I'm not a great king. I'm not a great God. I am the least of the apostles. And I do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. No, not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preached. And this is what you believed. You know, right here, Paul was impacted and affected by the grace of God. When God's grace saved Paul, the worst of all sinners, the least of the apostles, the least of all God's people, he goes, it is not going to live inside of me without an effect on my life. And so through the grace of God, Paul was ignited to work harder than all the rest. You go, now who's all the rest he's referring to right here? The other apostles. Wow. That, that, that's the impact that being saved had on Paul. That's so our second point. Ignited by Jesus through our resurrection. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there that want to want to do the right thing. You know what I'm saying right there? We don't, we don't feel motivated. We don't feel inspired to do what we know we need to do. And we, we want somebody to motivate us. So we want somebody to encourage us. We want somebody to push us to do the right thing so that we can want to want to do the right thing. But, you know, that's not really how it works right here. Paul was ignited because God already did all that he needed to do to motivate him. The issue was Paul needed to see himself the right way, and then he could be motivated to do what God wants. Turn with me to Psalm 51. You know, right here we find a, a, a psalm that David writes after he falls into sin with Bathsheba. And, uh, you know, God really humbled him with the sin right here because he went from being the great king of Israel to being reduced to a, a pathetic sinner like us. And so here he is, and he's literally being restored in his relationship with God. And in Psalm 51, verse 3, we'll pick it up right there. He says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. You, you ever feel like that? Like no matter where you go, you're always thinking about the thing, thing you did to mess up? Yeah. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and are justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Wow. That's where David was at right here. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Verse 16. You do not delight in sacrifice or I'll bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. You know, it's very interesting right here. After David sinned, he finally figured it out. God doesn't want us to just do all this stuff without having the right heart. He goes, you know, I sinned, and I'm broken. I'm desperate. What do I have to do to be right with God? 
And he begs God here, please don't take your Holy Spirit. Please don't cast me from your presence. Please help me hang on to my relationship with you. David's sin brought him to a place of brokenness. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You know, guys, I, I don't know about you, but last week I was, I was convicted. Uh, of course, we had Richie from Santa Barbara come and preach the word to us. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, I, I've said this before, but I don't often get people coming out to preach to me. Usually I've got to preach, and, and the part of my job is to get in the word and have the Bible or God preach to me. And so it's a real treat when I have another preacher come out, and then I get to hear them preach at me. And I was, I was just so convicted uh, by the lesson that Richard gave, and particularly when he addressed the sin of Assyria. And uh, historically, if you go back to the seven deadly sins, uh, the sin of sloth is the word Assyria. That, that's where that comes from right there. And uh, the, the definitions that Richard gave is a willful refusal to enjoy a relationship with God. Valuing a future situation over a present moment. And dissatisfaction, a lack of peace, or a lack of concern or care, bottom line, apathy. And I was thinking about this, and I was, I was personally convicted because I think it put me in touch with the sadness that had been growing inside my own heart that I wasn't really in touch with. And uh, I think it really came out this past week uh, where I wasn't feeling inspired to preach. And for me, when I don't feel inspired or fired to preach, I know there's, there's something going on in my heart. And uh, so it was awesome. On Wednesday night, I had the guys all get together, and we had a night of prayer. And, uh, you know, it was for the guys. I thought that, that would benefit the guys, but a lot of that was just because that's where I was at. I needed prayer. And then again, on Friday, I was putting together my lesson. I was just thinking, I was just having a hard time thinking what I wanted to preach because there's still that sadness in my heart. And I was going, why am, why am I feeling sad, or why am I feeling apathetic? Why am I feeling depressed? And I thought about it, and, and one of the scriptures that Richie uh, alluded to last week was the hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I was thinking, I was like, you know what? My issue is, is that I've always wanted to leave San Diego at a certain point. Where my dream was to get San Diego cranking and get to a certain point and then leave and then go to plant another church. And I, I'm handing off my baby, so to speak, to another minister so that he can get it to the point that I wanted to get it to. And that just kind of hit my heart. And, and I think that there was a sadness that I allowed creep in. And it affected my relationship with God. It affected my ability to lead the congregation. And ultimately it hurt God. And as soon as I saw that, I go, you know what, i got to repent right here. And I just had, I, the last couple of days, I've had a great prayer. And yesterday, I was feeling super fired up to preach. You're going to, how do, how do you, you feel, or how do you get broken about your own sin? Number one is you've got to look at how it's affected other people. Number two is you need to look at how it's affected you. Now, for me, it just took my joy away. It took my passion away, my zeal away. And lastly, you need to look at how it's affected God. When you see those three things, I promise you, you just go, wow. My sin is serious. And then when you identify how serious your sin is, and you accept the grace of God, you still got to accept the grace of God right there. You go, wow, God's grace is amazing. He's willing to take my sin, the junk that's in my heart, and forgive me of this stuff. And then you can feel motivated, inspired, and ready to preach the word. Look what happens in verse 18 right here. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. See, David needed to come to a place of brokenness, and then he could do the will of God. If you're not about building the church... If you're not all about sacrifice this morning, you have not been broken as a disciple. And you've got to get your heart, you've got to identify the sin that's there, and you've got to go, man, I've got to get broken. And I promise you, when you get broken about your sin, you will be moved, impacted, and inspired. The grace of God will have an effect on your life. You will be ignited by Jesus through our resurrection. You know... When you participate with Jesus' resurrection, you get fired up about our resurrection. The last thing to do is get excited about our future resurrection with Jesus. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. One of my favorite scriptures. It says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the perishable has been called with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. Then the saying that is written will become true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Wow. The Bible's saying right here, a mystery. Paul goes, hey, I want to I let you guys in on a secret right here. This life's not it. This, this is temporary. Everything you see here is perishable. I promise. For, forget the ads that say you can have beauty for life. <laughs> They're not true. They're not true. The buildings you see will fall apart in time. The life you live will be forgotten. Everything we see around us is temporary. But yet with the resurrection to come, we will all be changed. The perishable will inherit the imperishable. Mortal will be clothed. Mort mortality will be clothed with immortality. And the Bible says that death will be swallowed up in victory. Yeah, I don't know how many of us caught the, the final four yesterday. I don't know how many basketball fans we have in the house right here. We got one. We got one. We're working on that. Well, you know, I, I, I didn't get a chance to watch it. I was too busy being a disciple and all that. And, uh, but I, I read that Wisconsin beat Kentucky. Now, Kentucky has been undefeated all year. And yet, well, this is the small little school, Wisconsin, just took them out. 71 to 64. Seven point win. Then I also read that the other game, Duke against Michigan State, Duke beat Michigan State 81 to 61. That was a blowout right there. <laughs> what Paul is saying right here is, guys, this is not a Wisconsin versus Kentucky game right here. Just a small little victory. This is a Duke versus. Michigan State game right here. We're going to get blow this thing out of the water. Amen. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And so what do we do? He goes on. He says, well, stand firm. That's, that's always a good idea. Let nothing move you. Has anything moved you this past week? And there's the convicting part right here. Always give yourselves how much? Fully. Fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, everything you do, all labor that you do, biochemistry, working as an engineer, working at a hospital, at the end of the day, you might do a good, a good for a lot of good people and they might live a little bit longer even because of some of the things you've done, but eventually it all comes for nothing. It all ends in death. But your labor in the Lord is eternal. And so laboring in the Lord is awesome. It's awesome. The fact that Bobby gets to preach the word. He's not making the money and they're not living the comfortable lifestyle. But Bobby gets to preach full time for the Lord. He's doing something that's going to last for eternity. When we go and share our faith with somebody, when we sacrifice our money that we're probably going to blow anyway, so that churches could be planted in Manila or Africa or Indonesia or Mexico City or Russia, wherever the world takes us, that labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, one of the things I, I tell our group before service, every service, 
is that this is going to be the most exciting service you've ever had. And usually I get one or two looks and I go, no, no, this is the most exciting service you've ever had. <laughs> Why? Because each day you live on this earth is one day closer to heaven. One day closer to the resurrection that's to come. And so guess what, guys? This is the best church service you've ever been to. Don't you guys feel that? Don't you guys feel inspired by that? But we need to come to a conviction. Jesus can raise the dead. Jesus has raised the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. That's why we're here this morning to celebrate Easter. And Jesus will raise the dead again. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. United with Jesus in his resurrection, ignited by Jesus through our resurrection, excited for Jesus and the final resurrection. You guys have a great Easter Sunday. Love you guys. God bless you all.